congratulations to the honorable member. I'm sure the people of Nkranza are very proud of your exploits. We in the party are as well. The, from your CV, I awards and honors. I see that in 1987 and 1994, you were awarded for long service and good conduct medal. That was the award. And at the same time, you were, in 1994, you were awarded also for long service and efficiency medal. Over the years, I see these traits in your leadership style. But on the 20th of March, 2017, this year, you appeared on a TV program in which um, a young journalist was complaining of having been brutalized by some 40 military officers. The news item that has come out subsequently, and I'm very, I've cited a petition also, a public petition, in fact, from the NDC parliamentary candidate for the 2016 elections in Swami constituency, Mr. Broja Jenfi. In this petition, his claims are that you justified the beating of this journalist. You are heading for the defense ministry as a deputy. Can you explain or throw more light on this matter? Because for, for many, it may be that the media has wrongly reported your comments. So give us context in, in that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity, opportunity given me now to clear the air. I have said it time and again on so many uh, platforms, on so many radio stations and TVs, to correct that impression. That is wrong. The journalist in question, according to him, he was beaten at the beach on the day that we, uh, the 60th anniversary was organized. After the incident, he was beaten by soldiers. And it came on a, I was called as a soldier, once a soldier, I, I should say whether it was correct for a journalist to be beaten. Right away, I said, no way. It's not written anywhere that somebody should even be beaten to start with. And when such an issue comes up, because it has, it has happened on so many occasions, we have to investigate to know the truth. At times, it's blown ab above proportion. At times, it may not even be true. So what I told the, the, the interviewer was that investigation is supposed to be conducted and we know the truth. Later on, the, it, it, the same station who, I, who has that uh, FM station called me that oh, they needed me to uh, feature on their program, and I went. When I went, the journalist was sitting there. And before we even went to the stage, I pitied him because he had something around the neck, meaning that he had been beaten. He couldn't even turn, uh, not even uh, one degree. So I asked him so many questions, and he told me. So we went, to, uh, we went and started the program. I said a very na some nice, uh, things on, on, on the TV, and then told him that I wanted to give him pieces of advice, that any time such uh, occasions happen, he should not rush to take videos of those who uh, he thinks that we're doing the wrong thing. Otherwise, he may be harmed or even be killed. Now, we may not even know whether the people were even soldiers. He said, 
they belong to uh, Usu military barracks. Meanwhile, we don't even have any military barracks in Usu. He said that the, somebody came up to mention that he was a WO Mensa. He, he, cannot even, uh, he couldn't even identify that person. But when I asked him, he said he had reported the issue to the police. I said, fine. I condemn that act. And if it is true that they beat you like this, I don't think they have done well. That was my first charge that I have mentioned that if it is true, I should side with him that what he was saying was true. I said, no, I haven't even seen those who beat you. I haven't been listening to that side. So I cannot see. But if the way you are saying, the way you are behaving, the way you are sitting down, the way you are suffering, if it is true, then they didn't do well. I condemn that. I said it throughout the whole program. That one was not captured. That one was not captured. I said, I do not like a situation where some people go and misbehave to tarnish the, 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 the reputation of Ghana Armed Forces. And then instead for us to single out that person or those, that, 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 those people, then we put them under the umbrella of Armed Forces, and then they will hide. So it's better we wait for the investigation to be carried out. We single them out and deal with them, punish them, rather than saying that uh, accusing Armed Forces, lambasting them, and that will go a long way to uh, tarnish their reputation. Maybe those who even went there may not have been sent to that place by armed forces. They may not even be soldiers. So that is the advice that I give. Then the host of the program asked me whether I support the armed forces or not. I said, yes, I have to clear the name of armed forces, but not those who perpetrated that brutality. When the guy saw that, heard that I said I support Ghana armed forces in all things, and not the issue of being beaten by some people who may not even belong to armed forces. Because that day, we had uh, uh, people who were in uniform, cadets, who also attended the parade. They may, they may beat some of them. So I don't support the beating. I don't encourage the beating. But we have to clear the name of Ghana armed forces, because the commander of Ghana armed forces is the president of Ghana, and then he would, the president of Ghana would not want to preside over military brutality. So let's clear that thing. The guy got annoyed that uh, I said I defend Ghana Armed Forces. Perhaps maybe he didn't hear. The guy who was suffering from the neck, and he couldn't turn even one degree, he just turned 180 degrees All right. and raised <laughs> abuses on me. Suddenly turned 180 degrees. Yes. Anyway. Uh, that's enough. So it is not correct. For me, that is important. I want to put it on record. It is not correct. You did not say that civilians will be continued to be brutalized by the military. You didn't say, sir. Not at all, Mr. I would not even say that at all. I, 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 yes, if you have any more questions. And for the record, he was my classmate in Kofi Annan. So the lessons I learned there, he also learned there. Yes, sir. Mine are showing, his aunt. You have more work to do there. <laughs> you want, I thought I heard you on air that day saying that it is because of his mouth that is why he has been beaten. And if he doesn't change his attitude, he will continue to be beaten. Did you actually say that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. After a very nice program, you know, even advising him what to do and what not to do, pitying him, and then saying that, even giving the number of the PRO, Armed Forces PRO, that you should go to him because he also came into the program and then said you should see him. I directed him to him, that those people will be punished. For me, for you to realize that all things that I say that I defend Ghana Armed Forces, and not those people. I think he didn't hear. And they started raining, raining insults on me. I told him that my firstborn is a journalist, and I wouldn't be happy that she's in age with my fourthborn. And I wouldn't as well expect that he will insult me, not anywhere, even on that program. So if he will not take my, the advice I gave him earlier on, and he continues to insult people, not even soldiers,
But even civilians, if you continue to do that thing, they will beat him. I said that one. But I didn't support those who beat him. And I will never support brutality. Well, there's a general perception that soldiers uh, settle scores with uh, brute force, generally. And uh, we observe it all the time. They, they say do before complain, they're not it. So once they hold you, they won't ask you questions. It's like, uh, as for the slap, it's a salute. You will get it. That kind of mentality or perception of the military, uh, if you link that, join that with your admonition that if you continue to insult people, they will beat him. You seem to confirm the fact that actually soldiers, uh, you, you as civilians, you, you can't tolerate even in discipline tolerance without as civilians without applying brute force. Is that not the case? Mr. Chairman, it's not the case. We don't support beating. It is not written anywhere in the regulations or in the, the laws of uh, Ghana Armed Forces that uh, uh, civilians should be beaten any time we, we get in, uh, in contact with them. It is not written anywhere. What the perception, the perception they, they have about soldiers is currently not the case. I know Armed Forces was associated with brutality, I'm aware. And that was how Armed Forces evolved from the colonial days because the armed forces were those who were used to uh, provide uh, or, or give protection for the colonial traders. And they showed some brutal force on civilians. But currently, the situation has changed over the years. That is why this time, armed forces opens its doors to the, 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 civil, the, the, the public for them to come and see what they do, what they have. The myth surrounding the armed forces is not what is perceived up there. So this period is not like that. Even this issue, I know Armed Forces Commander has issued instructions to all units that anybody at all who goes to misbehave will be dealt with. And they continue to do this uh, 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 announcement or uh, education to the, the soldiers. Nobody will shield you if you go and misbehave. So it is not in our status that you go and then start beating people. You'll be dealt with. Mr. Chairman, as a follow-up to the answer you just gave, we need to improve civil military relations, as you've just indicated, to move away from the perception that the buga buga mentality still persists and that they enjoy brutalizing civilians. But in addition to the annual open days, can they do more? to uh, demystify the uh, armed forces and improve the perception that the ordinary citizens have about them? Can they do more than merely opening their doors once a year to civilians come and walk around there and have a nice excursion? Can they do more to improve upon this perception that still persists? Yes, Mr. Chairman, they have even actually been doing more. They've been appearing on TVs or radio stations, and then talking about the relationship between armed forces and then the, the, the civilians. Uh, we I will expect that they can go ahead, or there's more room for improvement because the perception, as we are seeing, is still there. And therefore, if they take steps forward, I think it will help. Honorable, um, I had an interaction with some soldiers and I asked them questions about the way they react to civilians. What it told me is that it is the training that as long as or any time they wear the uniform and they are uh, calm, if you permit any civilian to insult you, you have disgraced the military uniform. And so, once a civilian, in their words, misbehaves, it is their duty to discipline the person because it is not about them. It is the military uniform. 
this kind of training, if, is that true, if it's so, does it not give a different impression of uh, what you're telling us as against how your soldiers behave on the ground? Mr. Chairman, he gave you the wrong uh, information. It is not true that uh, soldiers, if you wear uniform and uh, somebody misbehave, you have to you know, beat him. Or the training uh, is geared towards beating people. It is not true. Otherwise, then they, 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 everybody in Ghana would have received so many slaps. So yes, I've been coming here. But is everybody uh, in, in uh, misbehaving towards the uh, military? No, they say those who misbehave towards them, the uniform, like, like the gentleman uh, who says insulted you, if you were in uniform, according to their training, and if you let him go, then it means that you have permitted him to insult the uh, military uniform. So, so long as you're in, 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 in the military uniform, and insults must be responded to with violence. Is that, is that the kind of training you give them? Mr. Chairman, that is not true. It is said that once a soldier, always a soldier. So whether in uniform or you are not in uniform, once you've been in the khaki before, you are still a soldier. If that, what you are saying is anything to go by, then they will have slapped him. Because I still take it off of myself, I'm a soldier. Mr. Chairman, it is never, never true that if you wear uniform or the training is that if anybody at all misbehaves towards you, you beat him. It is not true. It's very, very erroneous. You have been on the Defense and Interior Committee since you entered Parliament. And so you are intimately aware of the issues that they face every year. The question of arrears for feeding and other things come up. And um, even the acquisition of their uniforms. After the first set, they have to buy their own uniforms. You have also been a finance officer before. And if approved, you're going to be the deputy minister. What are you going to do to support your minister to make sure that these issues which plague the armed forces will be resolved once and for all? to the credit of the government of the NPP and Aneko Fuad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm already aware. I've been in the Defense and Interior Committee since I entered Parliament. Uh, currently, I'm the chairman of the Defense and Interior Committee. The last uh, budget, this current budget, I presented it, and I know the debt stock still remains not only uniform, uh, food, and that is a very big problem. I will team up with my, my, my minister to find a way. And before even uh, making any move, the president of the Republic of Ghana has already taken steps to deal with the death stock. The president has promised as a policy to even apart from the death stock, equip the armed forces adequately so that they can perform their duties to satisfaction. So once it's the policy, once the government has started, I just go and team up with my minister so that I uh, would speed the, 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 the process, the programs and plans that have been put in place already. we we'll make sure that we expedite action and then at the end of the day, we, we say that we have, we have cleared all these debts. It's a question of uh, money, funds. And once my government is, you know, is ready to uh, assist Ghana Armed Forces, because he wants Armed Forces which is uh, capable and ready and willing to defend the nation, I think we will we'll accomplish the tax. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congress again, Major. The impression that I get is that most of us who are not in the forces are sometimes ignorant of what goes on in the forces. Probably because there's not been much education about what, should, what is done in the forces and what we should know. 
how would you assist and advise your minister for the general public to know more about the forces, whether Navy, uh, the armed forces, general forces that you would assist your minister in supervising and administering? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, what I will do is straight away uh, suggesting to my minister, we put our heads together to see how best the interaction with the civilian uh, population will be uh, something that would go a long way. We can meet, meet the people as in, 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 in other jurisdictions they do, apart from the open day that we have with uh, other parts of the society, who also engage the, uh, the population or the, the citizenry. And that would be my suggestion to the minister. And if he buys it, then we'll go ahead and they interact more with the civilians, but we would let them know what happens in the military, the perception that they have about military, and then that would erase all that those uh, erroneous uh, possessions, and I think we'll be on the same channel. Sure. Yes, um, I, Mr. Chairman, I want to offer the nominee this platform to be able to talk about an issue which probably, if I don't raise it here, the media may want to find out from you. The question is simple: How would a major supervise generals? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman, uh, let him come up with a question again, because uh, because uh, I, if you mount some questions, uh, you can't hear properly. So just uh, yes, um, I was saying that I should be able to ask you this question and offer you this platform for you to explain, because obviously a media person will want to know that you retired as a major in the army and you are going back to to the army to supervise officers and men and some of them who may be higher than the rank at, at, on which you, or at which you left the military. Mr. Chairman, I am now a member of parliament, an arm of government, and therefore my position as uh, a minister, deputy minister, uh, I am going to support my 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 uh, my minister uh, to uh, unveil his uh, policies, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman. How for is a disciplined institution. I have my seniors, my colleagues who are in the armed forces. Anytime I go there, they salute me. That is the first point. Even the CDS respects me as a member of one of the arms of government, and therefore it's not out of place. They don't have any problem about that. They are even happy that I am coming home. They don't have any problem about that. We are not, we are not sending you back to become a soldier, so you are not, you are not going home. This is still your hope. You only be representing the president. And I think in the military, you have a saying that Military uh, authority is subject to civilian control. Is that right? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, come again. It is in the military balance to say that military authority, uh, military power is subject to civilian control. Is that right? Exactly. So, Mr. Chairman. Because you're under that the is why the president, who is a civilian, is the commander is, uh, in chief, uh, commander in chief of the armed forces. Okay. Any more questions? On all right. And I have my own questions. The complaint, if you go out there now, and you assembled hundred young men from every part of the country who are willing or want to join the armed forces. You will not get even to who believe that they can enter the armed forces on their own strength, with their own intellect, 
or with their own qualification in it. Because the belief now is that if you don't know anybody or somebody who knows somebody, you can never join the army. Uh, how can we change this perception? How can we change this perception? Mr. Chairman, I think uh, I'm happy that you say it's a perception. It is never true that if you don't know anybody, you cannot join the force. So uh, that perception must be corrected. It is never true. How? It is never true because I joined the armed forces and I didn't pass it through anybody. 19, 19 how many it's years? It's still ago? the same. Eh? We're in the 20s, so. though. Mr. Chairman, it's still the same because this thing is, uh, the recruitment is advertised in the, the, the newspapers and uh, you apply. This time it's not even the case that you apply, you go and queue up and then they select you. You apply online and then nobody knows you. Based on your qualification, the requirements, you'll be picked or you'll be, the, the short list will come out. You go, they even come to uh, uh, your, your area where you choose to, to, uh, uh, to be screened. And then they will screen you there. And after that, you will do some small tests. Then they pick you. There's regional balance. There's a gender balance, and I don't think that until you know somebody or if you don't know anybody, you wouldn't be able to join the, the, the force. So many people have joined the force. Even from my constituency, I didn't even know that they were even there. I didn't even lead them. Times if they, they would even come here, they would even come and sleep at my place. Some get a chance. I'm a member of, uh, I was in the armed forces. My mates are there. And I'm also a chairman of the Defense and Interior Committee, so I could have used my position to push them in. But if you are not qualified, you are not qualified. If you are qualified, you get a chance. It's Irina's impression, Mr. Speaker, Chairman. Well, now, do, does the Ghana Army meet the international requirements in terms of numbers as we speak now? Or is there room to increase the numbers to give opportunity for many more young men? than what we take uh, every year. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the, the President has said that this year they would recruit more soldiers, and that is the policy of the government, because we are not up to the standard. Uh, the Honorable Mayor, do you want to ask a question? This is no brand of alliance. Oh, ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, the nominee just made reference to gender and regional balance in the armed forces. Yeah. I am just asking him, how can we ensure that there's true regional and gender balance in the armed forces? Mr. Mr. Chairman, you can ensure that through the selection process, the team would move to the region and the allocation of the number to be uh, recruited is stated and given them we are taking, say, 100 from every region, depending upon the population or the, the ratio. Uh, that is what is done. And I don't think they've, uh, they've departed from that uh, uh, guidelines. Honorable nominee, you were in this chamber when we requested a report of uh, recruitment, which showed that for the regions, in most cases, more than half of the people in each region were from the same particular region. They're not the specific region. For example, if you take Eastern region, half, only half of the people who were recruited from this region were indigenous of Eastern region. The remaining half were from some specific regions. If you took Ashanti, the same thing. If you took Greater Accra, the same thing. Greater Accra was much worse. Right. And the explanation was that, well, uh, they have come to the region, so everybody uh, in the region is. Is that the case that we are uh, using the region, regional balance as, as a ruse to recruit people we have in mind, or is it true regional balance? Mr. 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 Chairman, I think I was also in the chamber, and uh, the explanation given by the minister was that it could be an anomaly because the, 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 the principle is that regional balance should persist. And therefore, if 
that was the, the mistake he was going and then that uh, anomaly will be corrected so that uh, we we'll get the line straight. I'll, I'll give the Minister for Employment the opportunity now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just taking it from where you ended, I just want to know from the nominee, if he's given the nod, whether he will consider um, advising his uh, minister to consider having the regional selection um, taking place simultaneously so that you wouldn't have a situation where somebody will have to move from region A when he was not successful to region B to try his luck. That situation will not arise in the sense that the same day they expect the, to close the, the, the process, application process will be there and every, those who apply will apply at the same time and then they will close. It is when they will come to the regions upon your indication that you want to be screened at that place. If it's Sunyani, Takrade, who, so the application has already been received and you've been shortlisted. So it can happen that somebody will move from uh, Tamale and come to Sunyani or Takrade. It, it can happen. I'm not. <laughs> Just to add on from where Honorable Chairman left off, he was talking about regional balance. I want to move on to gender balance. I want to find out from the, the nominee what he will do to assist his minister to ensure that women are given equal opportunity to serve in the Ghana Army. Thank you. Uh, at times, they find it very difficult to get the women. They, at times, don't even come forward. But these days, it looks like uh, the women are trying their best. So the number allocated to the women will still be there. They should push up and then they'll, they'll, be, they'll, they'll be considered because nobody can go and change from man to woman to go and take that appointment. If that is their number, they will be considered. So they should do well also to, to apply. As I said, at times they don't even get the women to, 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 to move into the, the to, or to join the force. Now, they are more adventurous. They are willing and ready. So maybe the military's policy on the number of women they are prepared to admit as a whole is what you think that you may want to consider an increase. Because now, uh, because now uh, many more women are willing and ready to join the armed forces. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll give the last one to Honorable Jato. Congratulations, Honorable. We know the military go on the retirement earlier than the normal civilians. Um, is it possible we look at some arrangements such that at least after retirement we can still get them actively, because some of them are, are, are very strong, to get them actively engaged in, so to speak, this private security type of thing. I, I'm trying to suggest, because if you leave them in the wild, I think some of them uh, go contrary to, they use the military style, like you mentioned, outside to do things that are not comfortable for society. Can you suggest something like that for, to your minister? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I agree with you, and I, I think I take your suggestion. In other countries, that is what is done. I know in the uh, Malaysia, that is what is done. Or retired officers, retired soldiers are considered in other employment because they've gained a lot of experience. And if uh, they should retire maybe at the age of uh, uh, 35 or 45 and then they are thrown out, nobody minds them, uh, it's not the best. So I'll take your suggestion. I would uh, do consultation with my minister and we see how best we, we, we can go about it. Very well, I think that's the end of that question.